there is this commitment now to stop deforestation for the you know for solely for grazing. We're trying to displace uh, an industry that's been around for millennia in 15 years, 10 years time. So it's going to take energy and I think people need to be patient. Well, is this, you know, genetically, is this Frankenstein? Is this genetically modified? And I'm like, no, it's not genetically modified. They're like, well, then how does this work? You know? Hi there, and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome Eric Jenkuski, the CEO and co-founder of Matrix Meats. Hey, Eric, how are you doing? Good, excellent. How are you, Anat? Yeah, good, and uh, great to have you on the show. You're dialing in at the moment from Columbus in Ohio, is that right? That is correct. And that's your hometown? It's our hometown. It's my it's it's my new hometown. I'm, I'm originally from New York, but... Uh... Went to university here and and uh, ended up living living here. Met my wife at university, and now we live here in Columbus. Awesome. So, can you tell me what Matrix Meats is and how your company works with other cell based uh, meat companies? Uh, Matrix Meats, the name itself, is a little bit of a misnomer in that we don't actually produce any meat. But what we do do is we design and manufacture three-dimensional nanofiber scaffolds and microcarriers for the cultivation of meat. So we replicate the extracellular matrix that exists in uh, living organisms that provide the roadmap for the cells to grow on and the cues that they need in order to differentiate and and expand, uh, et cetera. Yeah. And so can you talk a bit more specifically about what your products are, what they're made of, and what actual challenges it does solve as well? In an attempt and and to honor the reason why we're in the business in the first place, uh, and that is to reduce our dependence upon animal-derived products, all of our products are from non-animal-derived sources. Uh, Most are plant-based, whether it be Zane, which is corn protein, or pea protein, or soy protein, uh, also with uh, some synthetic FDA-approved compounds for human consumption that break down into everyday compounds and or uh, materials found in the body. Yeah, and just on the synthetic side, um, it's the same sort of material that you might have on pill capsules, is that right? Uh, Correct, except non-gelatin based. Yeah, that, that's an important one for sure. Because I think some of those pill capsules, weren't they sort of like rice-based before? Or you used to get ones that have that sort well, of Well, they were ge- gelatin, which is derived from pork. And uh, that that is uh, you know something that even culturally is important to, to be cognizant of, uh, whether or not you're a vegan or, or et cetera. But uh, so we, we've focused on only utilizing uh, compounds that are already FDA approved, already grass. So this way we can utilize those in order to, we are investigating some additional compounds uh, that are out there that uh, we may, if, if necessary, seek grass or, or, or seek FDA approval to use because they are already being used in the pharmaceutical world, just not uh, as a food ingredient. And if we're able to do that, I think we can we can make some some real strides in in some of the products that we're working on developing for the industry. Mm, yeah, and so you speak to a lot of the you know cell based companies presently around the world. Which companies do you think are really sort of leading the way at the moment, and which companies are you currently working with? Well, we have non disclosure agreements with our customers. There are. So I'm not at liberty to, you know, to say, but I, but I think that there's clearly a number of companies that are out there on, on the cutting edge. Recently at CMS 2021, we saw a fantastic demonstration, you know, from wild type with their, you know, with their salmon. Uh, I think that's, that's a, you know, a company you can be excited about. A, a number of the companies from Olive Farms to Mosa Meats, uh, Upside, I, I think everybody is, is uh, really, really working hard at, at advancing new age. Uh, I think there's so many companies that are out there that, you know, some we work with, some we don't, some we admire, uh, some we'd love to work with. <laughs> 
Uh, but at the same time, there's just a lot of advancement, a lot of money coming into the space, which is which is necessary. In at CMS, uh, our my co-founder, uh, Dr. Jed Johnson, our CTO, he he was on a panel talking about you know scaling and how we scale this industry. And one of the comments that he made, which is a, which is so so accurate, is that we're trying to displace uh, an industry that's been around for millennia and. 15 years, 10 years time. So it's going to take energy. And I think people need to be patient. It's going to take energy and time and money and I- innovation. Uh, but I do like the amount of resources that are being focused on uh, from an intellectual standpoint, as well as a capital standpoint to solving the problems that we need to solve in order to be able to uh, make cultivated meat a reality. Uh, I, I personally believe and i'm not and listen i am a dreamer i'm a you know a futurist but at the same time i'm also pragmatic and realistic uh because uh, my other life i i deal with the real you know i deal with reality every day and what what i see is the the critical mass occurring that's going to allow the industry to move to move forward and the products to be uh developed and the processes that we're going to need to be able to to scale and that's one of the reasons why we, we chose uh, electro spinning and electro spraying and some of those processes, because they already have a proven history of, of scaling uh, with other industries. Some of my sibling companies uh, utilizing the same pro- uh, product uh, patent portfolio ha- are already at scale uh, manufacturing product for the biomedical you know, world. So and regenerative medicine. So we, it, it's an industry that that I believe, if we if we take the lessons from from the other industries that we have, we can definitely scale this industry. Yeah, and so yeah, the technique that you mentioned there that you're using is called electro spinning. Can you explain how that actually works? Yes. So we take a compound and we liquefy it. And then from there, we are able to shoot it out of a basically a needle uh, with, uh, with both a positive and a negative charge uh, on, on either end. And, and when that liquid is shot out, it shoots towards a drum that spins and that drum um, has the uh, opposing charge. And it then, it then creates, by the time that liquid hits the drum, it's, it's a, now a fiber. It's, it's no longer liquid. It's now a, it's now a fiber. That liquid becomes a fiber. It, it kind of sticks to the edges of the drum, kind of like, you know, as, as candy floss, but in reverse Correct. sort of thing. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. It's very similar to your, you know, your candy floss machine at your local fair. Yeah. And, and those fibers that sort of come together, are they, they're not uniform in any way, right? And then you can take it off the drum and then sort of shape it, I guess. No, I, actually, we're able to, that, that, that's part of our, you know, I would say our, our trade secrets and our, our intellectual property is that we know how to create alignment in those fibers. We're able to control the fiber diameter, the fiber uh, length, or excuse me, the fiber porosity. Uh, we can input uh, different variables such as vitamins, minerals, growth factors, uh, et cetera. So uh, we're able to do, we're able to control a lot of the variables with our process. Yeah. So we can okay. make them aligned or not aligned or, or et cetera. Yeah. And one of the companies that you mentioned there leading the way, Upside Foods, they were previously called Memphis Meats. They've just announced last week their own production facilities and innovation center costing uh, in the region of $50 million. They have a capacity, current capacity to produce 50,000 pounds of cell-based meat with a future capacity, annual capacity to make 400,000 pounds mm-hmm. of cultured meat. I know obviously that 50,000 is is just a start, but it's fantastic, first of all, that there's you know a big player now that has released this uh, production facilities and just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that. I, I think it's amazing and should be celebrated. 
it demonstrates that this is possible. And as demand grows, the cost of inputs will go down and we'll gain economies of scale. It's just the beginning and it's super exciting and, uh, you know, cheers to, to Upside for being able to uh, open this facility and start to be able to produce cultivated meat that, that will help us as an industry change the, you know, change the perceptions that people have and will allow us to start getting product out where it can be sampled and tried and, and people realize, hey, this is, is actually a good product. And so I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about it. I, I think we need to be, as an industry, celebrating every one of these milestones that any of our colleagues within the industry uh, achieve. We should collectively be celebrating that. So cheers to, cheers to Upside. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And also in other recent news, the USDA has given a grant of $10 million US dollars to Tufts University in Massachusetts to help develop cultivated meat. And that's the other key side, right? We need more intellectual brain power working on this to, to solve this situation that we're in, especially with, you know, COP26 going on right now and everything mm-hmm. to do with sustainability that we know that animal farming, the way it is currently is just not a sustainable way to eat meat. Agreed, 100%. And I'm I'm happy that the the you know that the U.S. government uh, you know has has identified our industry as an industry of promise, and that they've decided to begin to put additional resources uh, behind it. Uh, Dr. Kaplan and and now the new Dr. Natalie Rubio, who who was an early advisor to to Matrix Meats, uh, uh, love the fact that that they were able to establish uh, the center. And, and that their experience that they already have in, in the cultivated uh, meat world will, will now just be expanded and they have, you know, a real investment behind them by the U.S. government to be able to do that. So very, very excited for, you know, for Tufts and, and what this also can mean for the industry. Yeah, for sure. I do think that the USDA does need to make improvements to dietary guidelines in, in the U.S., <laughs> Uh, so I think that's 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 a whole other show (laughs) yeah 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 Um, so yeah that's definitely one they they need to work on to also say that especially I guess eating the current form of red meat is not very healthy and and dairy too you're right so to try and do something in the interim before this new way of producing meat improves Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly, exactly. The the amount of attention now that's being placed on the industry, it's it's interesting because now for for the first time we have venture capital and and private equity reaching out to us uh, from the more traditional non-social impact investor uh, types, and 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 because they all now have mandates for ESG investing, and. Uh, they need. They don't know anything about our space, and they're they're looking. Luckily, uh, for you know, for folks like myself and the other CEOs that uh, and and uh, key opinion leaders that you know that you've interviewed, uh, podcasts like that, like this, give give us the opportunity to get our names out there, and and the, and the investment world reaches out to us uh, because of that. So I appreciate the opportunity to be on here to be on your your uh your your vcast and and very very excited about being having the opportunity to educate folks about this industry and and how what kind of an impact this industry can have uh you know on on the earth and and on society as a whole i was i was happy to see out of out of uh cop 21 that uh uh that or cop 26 sorry and um that that there is this commitment now to stop deforestation for the you know for solely for grazing, and uh, that's that's you know one of our main goals uh, as an industry I think is to be able to create this alternative uh, to having to graze uh, animals in order to be able to consume uh, valuable protein and, and protein that that you know growing middle classes in many parts of the world. Are, are going to be demanding in ever greater quantities going, you know, going forward. Yeah, 
And you, you mentioned about education there. I mean, what are the sort of questions that you people keep asking you? What are most people not so clear about? I guess from, <laughs> you know, Joe Bloggs in, in the public versus, I guess, even investors. Yeah, I, I think there, you know, there's there's a percentage of people that are like, no, I want my meat from a cow or I want my meat from a chicken or a pig or whatever. And, and you know, that's fine. There's going to be those people that are, you know, that are uh, that are not going to get on board out of out of the gate. Uh, but I think, that, you know, that there's a large portion, you know, we have, we'll have early adopters and then you'll have your, you know, your middle you know, your middle uh, to late adopters, but that, but that, you know, that middle 80%, that middle even 60% uh, in, in any number of studies have now said, yeah, they're willing, they're willing to give it a try. I mean, the, the biggest question I always get is, well, is this, you know, genetically, is this Frankenstein? Is this genetically modified? And I'm like, no, it's not genetically modified. They're like, well, then how does this work? You know, take a cell biopsy and we seed it onto a scaffold and a bio explain the whole thing. And I said, listen, Sir Winston Churchill in 1931, probably over a scotch and a fine cigar, you know, pontificated that, you know, that we'll one day not have to grow a whole chicken in order to enjoy a chicken breast. I said, you know, if he, I said if he had that kind of vision, you know, back then, almost, you know, now 90 years ago, you know, what, you know, what's so what's so wild or crazy about that? Uh, you know, we all love to watch, like, does anybody ever wonder how the folks in Star Wars eat? You know, like, you know, you know? and that's, a, you know, and, and I think that's, that's one of the things that um, when Hollywood gets, and we are seeing more, you know, more actors, et cetera, that are investing in this, in, in the space. Uh, but when Hollywood gets behind it, and maybe one of the, you know, future, um, uh, space movies or or any of the futuristic movies where we're trying to figure out how people are going to be able to uh, to eat. I think this, you know, you work that into the movie. That's how a lot of uh, popular culture changes, right? Is is mm. that is that we introduce ideas and concepts uh, into our into our music, into our TV, into our movies, into our literature. And, and once that happens over time, it gains acceptance and people, people gain an understanding and it's not as scary. Um, I, 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 I can't remember who exactly said it, but I think somebody from, it was somebody from GFI maybe that said in 2060, you're not going to say I'm eating cultivated meat. You're just going to say, I'm going to have a piece of meat. It, it's, it, you know, that, it, that, that moniker will fall off the front of the, that name will fall off the front of it uh, in time because once you have that second generation that grows up with it, it's, it, it's every day then at that point. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're two generations away from this, you know, where, where people are going to look back at on this, on this video cast. Right. And they're going to be like, I can't believe they were even arguing about it. Or I can't even believe they're even discussing this, you know, because <laughs> it'll be so commonplace that, you know, that, um, uh, people will find it odd that that we actually did things differently right now yeah. you know yeah so <laughs> uh, you know there's uh there's there's definitely some cases where you know where you get to see hollywood and science fiction films and whether it's you know star trek we no longer enslave animals for food purposes hmm? But we have seen humans eat meat. You've seen something as fresh and tasty as meat, but inorganically materialized out of patterns used by our transporters. With them, you know, 3D printing meat, mm. for example, mm -hmm. uh, and, and eating that. So, and that's the reality today, right? Um, right. So there are companies now that are using that as a different sort of technique to, to what you're doing. What are your thoughts on the companies that are using 3D printers to create meat and not necessarily scaffolding, but the actual, the whole piece? I, I actually, I take the approach that this is such a massive challenge uh, to displace the current system that all, you know, all, opportunities to do that should be addressed and investigated and welcomed. Uh, so I personally, I, I don't fear 3D printing. Um, I, I welcome it because I think anything, any technology that comes that 
that validates and advances the industry is welcome, in my opinion. And uh, so uh, I, I, I like it. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I've been a fan of additive manufacturing and, and uh, you know, 3D, 3D printing uh, in the more traditional sense, uh, more traditional manufacturing sense, not, not in the food, the food sector. But I mean, when you think about it, uh, the food industry has been extruding food for, you know, forever. And it's, in my opinion, it's just another, it's another form of extrusion basically, except utilizing, uh, you know, com- you know, computer aided design and, and, uh, uh, com- you know, CNC. So, it, it's it's uh, it's definitely welcome in my in, in my mind. I welcome it all. Yeah, and I think what you said earlier there was quite an uh, important point. Where the cell based meat isn't genetically modified, right? It's just a new process taking the cells from an animal and then growing them so they can um, basically then exist in a, in a new form without you know, having waiting months for the middleman, which is the actual animal to produce the meat. That education part needs to be improved, I think, to the general public. I think a lot of people, they conflate concepts and, and, it's, and it's, just a, it's just a lack of knowledge. It's not that they're, you know, it's not that they're, they're dumb or, or, yeah. or, I mean, some of the conclusions are, you know, are conclusions that I think, uh, you know, a- anybody would, would make absent the entire picture, right? And t- all the information. So, the the better job we do of educating the public, which I, I feel though that day is coming. I don't know if we're there yet, where we're we're ready to do a mass education uh, campaign. There are you know there's websites out there that you know that were developed to try to educate the public uh, on on cultivated meat. And when that you know the day the day will come because once uh, you know, once a company like say Upside or 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 Good uh, signs a deal with a major international fast food chain to launch, say, chicken nuggets, it, it's it's gonna. It, I mean, everybody's gonna you know gonna wonder about it at that point, and there'll be uh, you know there'll be a rat. If you look at the if you look at the marketing data or the sales data. Uh, for, for a number of, say, the hamburger chains, their best new hamburgers that have come out, you know, with the highest number of sales in the last several years have been all of their, their you know, their plant-based options. Now, unfortunately, in some sectors or some areas, once the initial excitement was over, it kind of, it kind of waned. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, you know, there are, you know, there's a number of people I mean, when I, you know, when I go through drive throughs now and I, and, and that particular chain has a plant-based option, I take the plant-based option, you know, and, and that's, um, you know, I think that's something that, and, and I'm, I mean, I'm not a vegan, I'm not a, a vegetarian. I, I, I do it because I want to, I want to do the right thing for, you know, for the earth and, and I do it because it's, uh, for me, it's an ethical, it's an ethical decision. Yeah. And you, so you don't eat red meat and you don't have milk. Is that right? But you do have chicken and cheese currently. Yes, that is correct. I eat, I eat chicken and, and I can't, I, I can't lie. I love my cheese. <laughs> I, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I do eat, but I don't, I don't eat, I don't eat red meat and I don't, um, I don't eat, I don't drink any milk. I, I haven't had milk in 20 years. I think it's been, yeah, or maybe, well, maybe be 25 years at this point. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping, hoping there's a, there's a cheese and uh, a chicken alternative company that you'll, you'll get to like soon. Um, I don't think yes, it's going to take yes. very long. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm hopeful. Um, I like using, you know, I like using, we even use here when we're prototype food products, uh, you know, we'll use just uh, eggs in, you know, like if we're making a, a protein carbonara or something like this, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll use uh, just eggs. I use it at home. Very good. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I'm hopeful that our uh, friends in Washington, D.C. at the USDA and FDA will 
uh, you know, I saw they just pushed out, the USDA pushed out their comment period from November 2nd to December 2nd to give industry uh, more time to uh, respond. We're going to be, we're going to be putting in uh, some of the things that we would like to see the government, uh, you know, be looking at and, and um, you know, how we think they should be uh, regulating the industry. Uh, but as a, as an ingredient, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have the full say that an actual producer like an upside or a new age or a wild type has. Right. Yeah. So your background is super interesting. Can you talk about it and also explain what led you to create the company? I've spent, and I'm still involved, I spent 30 years in, in the defense industry, uh, working all over the planet, uh, 42 countries to be exact. And um, I, I, I worked in logistics and doing what they call expeditionary operations. So if there's any, you know, any, any type of uh, forward operating that has to, ha- has to occur uh, from, you know, say tsunami relief, uh, I, I was in, as an example, I was in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake with the, with the U.S. Army 18th Airborne Corps um, that, uh, you know, we, we went down and were, you know, just providing basic, basic life support services to, to the populace, whether it be water, you know, fuel, et cetera. And uh, so my whole life has been solving really immense uh, problems very quickly (laughs) because, Mm. uh, and, 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 you know, I often tell people when you're in, you know, when you're in uh, East Africa and uh, something breaks, you don't run down to the Home Depot or the, you know, the, the big box hardware store because there isn't a big box hardware store to run down to. So you have to be very creative. You have to bring everything with you and you have to, you have to uh, figure out how to deliver uh, services where they don't, they don't exist or they were recently decimated. So um, I, I think I'm, I kind of applying that mindset to what we're doing, doing here and, and how I got involved, quite frankly, was, I was I was working with a um, a VC firm here in Columbus c- called Ecove uh, uh, Capital Partners, and uh, I was providing advisement on the military world. And in the course of doing that, over a course of a couple of months, uh, the CTO of the VC firm said, "Hey, we have this other company, and we think you should you, you should take this and run with it." And then I said, well, what is it? And he goes, at the time, you know, we were calling it cultured meat. He's like, it's cultured meat. I was like, cultured meat? I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, what, like, what is that? And then he explained it and he sent me all these emails. He says, hey, take two or three weeks, do a deep dive, read all these articles, listen to these podcasts, uh, et cetera, and then come back and tell me what you think. Well, after I did that, I, I, was, I was like, wow, this is amazing, number one. Number two, yeah, this is a huge problem. I've, I've always, as a long time, personally, as a conservationist, um, I, I, I never could, could put, wrap my head around, you know, the deforestation. I, I understand where, where there's poverty and there's, you know, a need to feed your family. You make decisions, right? And, and absent other alternatives, you do what you have to do. And, and it would be nice to be able to give people those alternatives. So I said to myself, this is what it must have been like to be in the room with Henry Ford when he engineers, hey, we're going to displace this thing called the horse and buggy with, with, a, with a combustion engine. You know, it's that kind of paradigm shift in the way the world does what they do. And, and, and this, is, this is like, a, a paradigm shift that that um, I think is up there, you know, with with the uh, I don't know the invention of fire and uh, <laughs> you know the pen, the printing press and and you know it's it's one of those major human paradigm shifts that that I wanted to be a part of and you know on any given day the you know the the products that my other company manufactures affect the lives of you know, a few hundred to, you know, maybe 10,000, 20,000 people. 
And this is an opportunity to be involved with a product that will literally positively affect billions of people. It's not every day you get that opportunity. And I decided to jump on it. And yeah. That's why I'm, <laughs> that, that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so your co-founder was already part of the company before you joined, basically he was, um, he had founded the company already. And then you came in on requests of, yeah. the, of the VC firm. No, no. Um, uh, we, we launched it together and, uh, he, he had actually co-founded Nanofiber Solutions, which is the, which is the company that uh, has, holds the patent portfolio that we have licensed uh, for the alternative protein space into perpetuity. So we're utilizing the 50 plus uh, patents that are issued and pending that uh, Jed and his company had, uh, had developed over the last 15 years. So 11 years is nanofibers, 15 years Jed's been, been, been working on this as a, as a PhD in material science. So, and that, you know, and, that, and that's one of the other important things that I point out to, to folks that we're actually mechanical engineers and material scientists. We're not biologists. We just happen to work in the world of biology and, and that our product is, uh, you know, replicates the extracellular matrix uh, and, and that's actually where we, we got the name from, uh, is that, um, I was sitting and I go, all right, you know, what are we going to call this? And I'm like, well, we replicate the extracellular matrix. Let's call it matrix meets, you know, it seemed, seemed, uh, you know, it seemed, seemed, uh, simple enough. So, and it was a name that, you know, the rest of the team, everybody liked it. So, so we ran with it. I do at times think that maybe, Maybe I think about dropping the meats part of it and adding something else like, you know, matrix, matrix FT, you know, like food technology kind of play on the, on the soccer world and, uh, but, but make it more food technology because that's what we really are. We're food technologists that are attempting to develop those scaffolds and microcarriers that will, you know, lead, helpfully enable this entire industry to, to uh, lead this, uh, this revolution in how we feed the world. Yeah. I mean, the, the other side is to go to the Hollywood direction and get Keanu Reeves to come on and then it's uh, the Matrix as the film. So yeah. especially with, with Matrix 4 coming out soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's definitely, yeah, there's definitely some marketing opportunities here, but, uh, you know, I don't know, William Morris Agency, all those, you know, big time, uh, you know, big time Hollywood agents, they charge a lot of money to, to uh, get your products written into shows. Uh, I've, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> so I was listening to a, a pitch the other day and there's a cell-based meat company there and they seem to be quite proud to say they're not working with any scaffolding technologies. And I was wondering why. Are there some cell-based meat companies that you've also heard of that don't want to work with scaffolding tech? Yeah, there again, like uh, just like the question about three D printing, there are multiple ways to produce cultivated meat, and our proposal is that that if you want structured meat, the best way to be able to do structured meat is to utilize uh, scaffolds or uh, you know scaffolds, microcarriers. Uh, you know, you can create you know what we call the mince meat product like hamburger and packing for sausage you can create that without scaffolds uh we think it's better with microcarriers, uh but you can do it and it's being done and and again uh i think there's room for all of us in in solving this problem that uh you know that 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 the whole the challenge is large enough and the need is large enough that uh, globally, we, you know, all the different technologies are, I think, welcome at the table. Yeah. So can you tell me how the company has been financed so far? Are you looking to do any new financing rounds? Yes. Uh, we closed our seed stage round a year ago, November 15, 2020. That round was led by Unovis uh, Capital Partners and our capital management. And um, when we first started talking to them, they were, they were still operating under the new crop uh, 
uh, moniker. And because they got on board, it allowed us to attract some additional really exciting you know, capital partners with CPT Capital and City Capital and, and Clear Current. And if you look at look at their portfolios, you see there's a, you know there's a lot of alignment in wanting to invest in an enabling technology. So uh, and then we also had um, Ecove uh, Venture Partners uh, put together a a special purpose vehicle uh, with some of their their investment network. So collectively, we 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 closed that uh, raise on November fifteenth of last year. Uh, we've hired, hired the team, expanded, expanded our operations. We just moved into a new uh, joint facility with, with NFS, like literally November 1st, we moved in here and uh, last week. And um, now we're uh, looking at that we'll probably move toward a Series A sometime in early 2022. Okay, awesome. So, yeah, it's an exciting field, isn't it? There's lo- lots of development going on, and I see lots of VC firms wanting to invest in companies like yours. And like you say, it's a global problem that needs to be solved and an important problem because, you know, let's face it, the rise of meat demand is, is, is increasing, especially in developing worlds. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I would like more people to eat plant-based foods, for sure. But in order to combat that, we need other solutions, right? Like what you're helping to develop. So it's, it's super important what you're doing. I think, uh, you know, even in, in the traditional, what I would call the traditional meat industry, you see many products that are hybrid products right now that are, that are uh, traditional slaughtered meat with, with, uh, you know, with plant, you know, with some type of plant filler, you know, whether it be potato or, or soy or whatever. And, and, and I think you're going to see the same thing in our industry, you're going to see cultivated meat being being paired with uh, you know with our plant based. So that you know that's one of the things that I always always tell. Farming is not going anywhere. You know, farming is still going to be an important part of our economy going forward. Here in Ohio, we have the Ohio Soybean Council, which is which uh, is heavily invested in identifying new and innovative uses for you know, for soybean and, and soybeans are already a primary staple of, of uh, alternative protein. So, uh, I mean, h- here in Ohio, we have Morningstar Foods, we have Good Catch, we have Os Matrix. So I, I started to think that Ohio is uh, becoming a, a little bit of a off the coast hub for alternative protein. Cause uh, you know, we're not in the Bay area. We're not, a, you know, we're not in Boston. So, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're located in, in a place where we have the brain power here. Uh, we have, uh, you know, great food technology uh, uh, resources at The Ohio State University, et cetera. And, and it, I, I always try to encourage people, yeah, it's great to be in the Bay Area. You know, it's great to be in Boston. But if you want your, if you want your, uh, your raise the last, uh, six months or 12 months longer, consider Ohio <laughs> because you can live really well here. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, there's definitely different exoduses happening out there, especially from the West coast over to more affordable areas at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's something that, uh, you know, pe- people want to know, like Columbus has become known in the, in the VCPE world as, as an insurance tech hub, because we've had now, two unicorns um, in the insurance world that, that were, that I actually watched one of the companies, you know, uh, pitch like their initial pitch. Cause we had a, we have a, a thing that we do here in Columbus called wake up startup where hundred, 200 uh, entrepreneurs and bankers and VC and PE all get in the, and three, three companies get the pitch once a month. And, and I, I, I saw the one company's pitch and, and lo and behold, literally like not even 48 months later, they sell for, you know, $3 billion. So, so like, uh, I, I think people need to realize, I mean, look at us, CPT's in London, Unovus is in New York and Amsterdam, City Capital's in New York and, and Clear Currents down in, down in Florida. I mean, 
uh, the, the, the overwhelming uh, majority of the money we raised was from outside of Ohio. And, and I think we, we're a perfect, and we did it during a global pandemic all on Zoom. So I, I, I think that, you know, people need to realize that, you, you know, it's nice to be in the Bay Area and it's nice to be in Boston and New York, but I think you can be someplace else and still be very successful at this. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Eric, for coming on the Definitely. show. It's great to have you on. My uh, pleasure. And, and tell your Thanks story. Yeah. And, and the best of luck uh, going forward. Abs- absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. All right. All right. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye.